Hello people, this is Mike and welcome to F2F Tech. Today we're going to be cleaning up and testing an AMD Radeon HD6950 and seeing how well it holds up in early 2018. This card was released back in December of 2010 at a launch price of $299 USD. It was released just 7 days after Nvidia launched their GTX 570. Now the 6950 was due to launch back in November of 2010, but it had to be pushed back due to component shortages. This chip is based on TerraScale 3, which uses the third iteration of the very long instruction word design. In short, this allowed for better utilization and performance per millimeter squared compared to the previous generation. The 6950 was built on a 40 nanometer process that was codenamed Cayman Pro. It was a slightly cut down version of the full chip Cayman XT, which is found in the 6970. Now both of these chips were true successors to the HT5870 and the 5850 that came before them. Now upon release this was the biggest chip per millimeter squared that ATI slash AMD had released since the Radeon 2900 XT, but it's still rather small compared to their high-end Fermi competition. Now Cayman was slated to be manufactured on the 32 nanometer process, but it never came to fruition due to a number of reasons, so some compromises had to be made moving to the 40 nanometer process. And due to this, the Cayman cards never performed as AMD initially designed them to. So AMD did what they do best, they fought Nvidia with aggressive pricing. Now the sample we're looking at today was purchased from an awesome member over on the hard forum. Now this card was kept in really great shape and believe it or not, it still had the do not remove stickers on the rear bracket screws, which also means the thermal paste has never been changed, so yeah. The first thing I did was remove the back plate, which serves no purpose other than looking sexy. Then I took off the entire cooling assembly, and one of the first things I noticed is the thermal paste looked like hardened Play-Doh, and in the process I ruined two of the thermal pads. Now glancing over to the right side of the card, we can see the odd looking Eaton made inductor, which makes up part of the VRM. Now these look very similar to the ones that are found on the HD5870. And here's a close up of the heatsink and the thermal pads. As you can see, the thermal paste is completely dried up, so I had to pretty much chisel it off. Now as I pulled off the shroud, I noticed that the heatsink used on this card is a vapor chamber one, very similar to one found on the 5970 and the HD7970. All of these reference 6950s come with a BIOS switch, and that allows end users to flash a custom BIOS and potentially unlock additional shaders like the one found on the 6970. Now my card will unlock, which is great, but we'll look deeper into that in another video. Well now that we disassembled the card and cleaned her up and applied some new thermal paste, let's take a look at overclocking. Now this card is based on the reference design again, so it has a core clock of 800 megahertz and a memory clock of 1250. Now starting with the Cayman series of cards, we now have the option to adjust the power limit in upwards of 20%, which effectively ups our TDP from 200 watts to 240. The stock voltage on the reference 6950 is at 1100 millivolts. And after a while of stability testing, I found that 1250 millivolts was a sweet spot. I could go all the way to 1300 millivolts, but it wasn't really able to extract any additional performance. Now, speaking of performance, I was able to get a stable core clock of 950 megahertz on the core and 1425 megahertz on the memory. Now, that's a healthy 18% increase on the core and 14% on the memory. And this was all done with cranking the power limit up to 20% as well. All right, well, here's a test system we're using today, and I know it's a bit dated, but it shouldn't be holding the card back in many of these tests. Also keep in mind, I did push the card pretty hard in most of the games, so dialing down the resolution and settings in some of them will obviously help to improve a performance. All right, enough jibba jabba, let's jump into it. The first game up is The Evil Within 2, and here we use the low preset at 1080p and average 24 frames per second. Now, oddly enough, after overclocking the card, we experience the exact same performance. Now I believe this has to do with the fact the game doesn't utilize the GPU 100%. And this is more likely due to legacy drivers or the game engine not playing nicely with the card. It's hard to tell at this point, so let's move on to frame times. Now looking at the graph, they actually look pretty good. We do see a lot of frame rate variability, and there are a couple 15 to 20 millisecond swings here and there, but overall, I'm pretty impressed. Also notice the VRAM is completely saturated. Destiny 2 is next on our list, and here we're using the low preset at 1080p. We average 40 frames per second in this demanding part of the game. Now after dialing in our overclock, we saw a 17% rise to 47 FPS. Now frame times were actually very good, and I found the game to be decently smooth and very playable. Now dropping the resolution can help us get closer to that 60 FPS mark. Overall, not a very bad showing at all. 
Now let's take a look at a performance of an extremely popular game, Fortnite. And here we use the medium preset at 1080p. Now we average 50 frames per second, and I didn't test overclock performance because I'm still working on the proper methodology for it. However, I did test performance with the newest update 2.2.0, which evidently improves overall performance, but oddly enough, I was actually getting worse performance versus the 6850 that I'd recently tested. Now I noticed in the areas with a lot of grass, the frame rate would tank into the 30s, and frame times didn't look that great as well. But for the most part, the game wasn't that bad. There wasn't too much jarring stutter, but I'll have to look more into the performance issues in the future. Shadow War is up, and we're testing this game using the low preset at 1080p. Now at stock, we averaged 25 frames per second, and overclocked the number jumped up 20% to 30. Now frame times looked great at the start of the benchmark, but they fell apart towards the end. It was nice having enough VRAM, but it didn't really help with the overall performance. Now oddly enough, one of the legendary captains was talking smack about how slow my card was, and that's pretty messed up. Gravewalker! Is that a 6950? Good. It's making it easier for me to catch you. Okay, so let's jump into the 2016 version of Doom. And here we're using the low settings at 900p, and unfortunately we do not have the option to choose Vulcan, so OpenGL it is. We averaged 41 frames per second, and overclocked the average grew 12% to 46. Now I noticed that GPU usage was a bit sporadic, bouncing in the 80s to 90% range much of the time. Frame times were pretty good at the start, but then they took a turn for the worse at the end of the capture. As it stands, the game is certainly playable, but not really optimal. Now let's overwatch it up, and here we're using the high preset with 100% resolution scale at 1080p. Now we averaged 72 frames per second, and overclocked that number jumped up 16% to 84. No real issues with frame times here, and the game ran very well. This was a great result for the 6950, and you can certainly use this GPU to play competitively. I've seen faster flipbooks than this next game, Assassin's Creed Origins. Now with a low preset at 720p, we averaged an amazing 15 frames per second, and overclocked that number rose a whopping 33% to 20. Now this game took advantage of our combined overclock, but it still wasn't enough to make it playable, though at least frame times weren't terrible. Now while we're on the topic of testing on realistic games for this card, let's take a look at another, Ghost Recon Wildlands. Now using the low preset at 1080p, the 6950 turned out 26 frames per second, and overclocked that number rose 15% to 30. Now frame times were shockingly good, and after we dialed in our resolution to 720p, this game could actually be playable, as I saw frame rates consistently over 30 fps. Though keep in mind, the game's performance is a bit worse compared to this built-in benchmark. Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice is up next, I think I said that right, and here we're using the low preset at 1080p. Now we averaged 35 frames per second, and overclocked that number rose 16% to 35. It's not a terrible result for such a demanding game. I will say frame times were wigging out in certain areas, and we saw quite a bit of this in our capture, as shown on screen. It's also interesting to see that the low settings, we still have plenty of VRAM left on the table. Okay, well there's only three games left, I promise. And the first of those three games is GTA 5. And here we use the high settings where we could, along with FXAA and 16XAF. I also moved the three graphic sliders to the middle. And with these settings, we averaged 47 frames per second, and overclocked that number rose 10% to 52. While frame times were not the best, we only saw three major spikes in our capture. Now, GPU usage hovered in the 80 to 90% range much of the time, and I've seen this behavior with other 6000 series cards using this legacy driver. Next up is Total War Warhammer 2, and we used a low preset at 1080p, and we averaged 28 frames per second. Overclocked, we saw that number rise 17% to 33. Now, frame times were excellent at the start and the middle of the test, but we experienced a lot of micro stutter towards the end, and this was repeatable with our stock and overclock testing. All right, well, the last game in our roundup is PUBG, and here we use the very low preset at 1080p with only 70% resolution scale. Now, we averaged 56 frames per second in our 22-minute capture. Now, we saw a bit better performance versus the last video that I did, which you can see above, and that's because the replay feature is around 3 to 10 FPS slower versus live gameplay. I didn't test overclocking in this title, but you can see with the average frame rates where they are, they'd be well into the 60s with an overclock. Now, frame times were just okay, but we frequently felt inconsistencies, but the game was still plenty playable. GPU usage remained in the 90% range, as you can see, and you can thank that to the recent update to version 1.0. Now that wraps up our game testing, but I'm still compiling a list of all my DX11 cards, 
in Unigen Valley, and I'm using the Extreme 1080p preset. And here we can see how well the 6950 stacks up to some of the other cards. As of right now, the Overclock 5970 is still the reigning champ, but we'll be adding some more cards very soon. Now let's jump over to GPU temperatures and fan speed. And to test this, we're using Crisis 3, and we're testing an ambient of 13C, which winter isn't coming, it's here. Now the stock 6950 core temperature stabilized at 75C, and that's with the auto fan speed maintaining at around 34%. Now with the overclock dialed in, I ramped up the fan speed to 75%, and the core temperature stabilized at 56C. Now this card has a very conservative fan speed under load, which makes it pretty quiet. Though when you jump the fan speed beyond 50%, it gets quite loud. We also used Crisis 3 to test the entire system power consumption. And at stock speeds, we saw a sustained load of 239 watts at the wall. And overclocked, that number rose 22% to 292. Now these numbers are not taking account for PSU efficiency, as they're all taken at the wall. All right, it's conclusion time, and it's pretty obvious at this point that AAA gaming at 1080p is off the table. But we could lower the resolution down to 720p, maybe do low to medium settings to get a decent experience. But there are plenty of popular games today like Fortnite, GTA V, League of Legends, CSGO, and plenty more that will run perfectly fine at 1080p. One thing you must keep in mind that this card hasn't seen driver updates since 2016, so a lot of the games haven't seen any optimization from AMD's driver team. I find it a bit disappointing that AMD dropped support for their DX11 Terascale cards as their Fermi competition still get regular updates. However, it's understandable because AMD knew that GCN was their future, so they focused more of their attention there. Now we'll have to do a comparison at some point with the HD6000 series versus the Fermi cards, so keep a lookout for that in the future. Now there's no denying that ATI slash AMD produced some amazing cards built on the Terascale architecture. The HD 4000 and 5000 series really stick out to me as they both took Nvidia by surprise with their excellent price to performance. So while everybody loves to throw the term AMD's fine wine technology around, I believe that really holds more weight with GCN and not so much with Terascale. Well, that wraps up my look at the HD 6950 in 2018. If anybody would like to help support my work on this channel, then please take the time to look at the video's description, and there you'll find Amazon and Humble Bundle affiliate links that give me a small kickback if you make a purchase. And as always, thanks for taking the time to watch the video.